In this video, we're going to be talking about something really important, something that I talk about frequently, but I know that this is a difficult thing for people to wrap their hearts around and really understand. And truly, it's something that you've got to receive from God. You just have to receive it from God. And that is regarding this false god of medicine, this false gospel of science that has been established in the world. It's got to come from him. I realize that this is an extremely difficult teaching. I myself was on the brink of death. And when I was still not healed, God had me throwing out medications and not going to doctors. I mean, that's a really difficult thing to do when you have been raised to think that it's doctors that heal you or it's medicines that heal you. And it's something that God proved to me in healing me personally I don't expect you to jump on board just because I am testifying this to you. Nevertheless, I will tell you that if God is testifying to my testimony, to the things that I say, to the things that I teach, to the way that I speak on the word, then if there's something that I say or if there's something that the word says that you don't quite understand or it's difficult for you to wrap your heart around, you got to receive it from him. You got to go to him and say, hey, What's this all about? What's your heart on this, Lord? So this morning I received a message from someone asking me, do you have a video talking about Luke being a physician, which I do talk about in several videos, but I'm going to go into it a little bit deeper in this video so that we can be clear about what scripture says and what it means that scripture is referring to Luke as a physician. And the second thing that she asked is, and Ezekiel 47, 12, where it says the fruit will be food and the leaves for healing. So I'm assuming that what she's asking is regarding using plants or medicinal herbs for medicine or using medicine at all. So we're going to get into this. I might end up, if it gets too long, I might end up splitting it up into two videos because I know sometimes it's difficult for some people to listen to you know, two videos, you kind of got to like sit with the material for a little bit and then go to the next uh, video. So uh, maybe I'll do that just to give that option. So the first thing we're going to take a look at in scripture is how physician is being used in scripture. And historically, I start out in Bible Gateway. Like if I just need to look up something really quickly, then I'll just look at it there. But I'm kind of leaning now more towards a uh, blue letter Bible just because there's a lot more tools on here in order to be able to look at the different contexts. You know, like for example, if you type in leaves on on Bible Gateway, and I may not even know, there might be some feature where you can weed this out, but um, I'm not a very tech savvy. But, but for example, if I type in leaves on Bible Gateway, I'm gonna get every context of leaves, right? I'm gonna get the noun leaves of green leaves, and I'm gonna get the verb leaves, like you left a city. And then I'm going to have to sort through all of that, and I don't even know if it's the same word in Hebrew or Greek. So Blue Letter Bible, while there's a few extra steps, it just allows us to, the the way that it's laid out with the tools and things like that, you're able to uh, achieve more specificity and accuracy because we are looking at it in English. We don't know if this is the same word, you know, across the board that's being used in Greek or Hebrew. So it's a little more accurate this way. So all I've done here is I've typed in physician. I tend to use the NIV version. You can use whatever version. Sometimes I, I go across versions to see if there's any difference, especially if the Holy Spirit is telling me, nah, there's something more. There's something more that you need here, and he's guiding me to do different things. So um, here, all I've done is I've typed in the word physician, NIV version. I go to the tools. I click on, you know, the um, uh, whatever the... the references the number that's next to which just happens to be h7503 in strong's concordance and so i'm going to pick click on that and i see first of all that the word that is actually being used in hebrew is rafa you may have heard this word before jehovah rafa which is actually spelled r-a-p-a and of course jehovah rafa means the lord is your healer rafa means to heal to make healthful of God, healer, physician of men, of hurts of nations involving restored favor. So think about that for a minute. Of hurts of nations involving restored favor. 
It, what does the Lord say? Return to me and I will heal you. Therefore, a nation who is hurting, if they turn to God, they're going to be restored in his favor of individual distress. So you have the distress of a nation. You have the distress of an individual. We have reference to, to mend, to cure, to heal, to repair, to make whole. The other thing that is not referenced here, that so this is of concern, you know, this, this is why we have to be aware of the word and the context and not simply rely on a concordance to tell us everything. We need to be aware of the word. We need to be attuned to God's Holy Spirit because God use, uses salvation and healing synonymously. So it's a little concerning that salvation isn't even mentioned in Strong's Concordance. So you got to understand the limitations of man to put something together. I happen to believe that Strong's Concordance is actually a very good resource. Again, it's not a commentary. I don't agree with commentaries. I've talked about that in other videos. Commentaries stand on man as the expert, man's authority. Strong's Concordance is standing on the authority of the word. So it's showing you the different contexts within the word where these different words are used what is the Greek origin? What is the Hebrew origin? How is it used? That's right. Because ultimately what we're doing when we're looking it up, like if I'm looking in Bible Gateway, for example, and I'm typing in the word, I'm looking at every context. How did God use this in a sentence? What is God's heart regarding this word? Ah, it just occurs to me that that's why God had me do that. Because what I learned from doing that is that the way God's using this in a sentence, the spiritual significance or the tangible symbolism that he establishes in order to help us to understand spiritual symbolism, that's the only reason I understand that is because I've looked up every context for healing and you can see that he uses healing in order to help us to understand salvation, how we're being healed from this condition. I wouldn't have gotten that from Strong's. So maybe both of them are important. I mean, I'll continue to use both of them. So we're going to start at the beginning of scripture. We're going to look at every single verse so that we can understand what is God's heart regarding healing. How are we to understand? What does it mean that someone is being referred to as a physician? And what does it mean, for example, when God says in Exodus, I am the Lord, your healer. So he's the physician. And I'm going to demonstrate for you in scripture that he does indeed have people he's using. So if you want to think of them as a physician's assistant, then you can understand that as long as you understand who the physician is. There are no human physicians. So the context of this word would have already had, people would have already had understanding because of what God built in them, that the Lord is actually the one who's healing you. And anyone who's being used by him is being used for him, not for the authority of the world. And physicians in the world, those who we refer to as physicians in the world, that this was not established back then. That is not what physicians looked like back then. What's happening today is that Satan has established physicians who work based on his authority, assuming that he is the one who heals. And you should be able to see that if you're looking at a discipline that fundamentally, the discipline of science that fundamentally rejects the creator says, you don't have a creator. I am your healer, not a creator. That was a lie. I am your healer and here's how you are to heal and you evolved and you have to go to experts, human experts to heal you and you have to ingest their pills and all of the things that historically were witchcraft. So you have to understand that even though they're, they're not saying that Satan is the one, Satan is behind that discipline. Do you remember in Revelation that it says that the dragon gives his authority to the beast and so that as they're worshiping the beast, they're actually worshiping the dragon. They're actually worshiping Satan as they're giving authority to science that fundamentally rejects the creator, claims that you evolved, claims that you need to focus on surviving and competing in order to survive. So rewrites what God established, his gospel, and causes you to defer to an idol. That idol has Satan behind it. He doesn't care. He does not care if you are saying that you worship Satan or if you're deferring to an idol of medicine, 
He's behind it. As long as you are turning to something else besides God to heal you, as long as your hope is in medicine, your hope is in herbs, your hope is in anything other than God, I don't care what it is. You pull out the hairs on your arm and you think that's going to heal you. I don't care what it is. Anything other than God cannot heal you. So we're going to we're going to look at this in scripture and scripture has well established this understanding. Genesis 20:17 Then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his female slaves so that they could have children again. What did Abraham do? Did he take a pill? Did he do some remedy, some sort of massage or medicine? No, he prayed to God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his female slaves so that they could have children again. They didn't go to a human fertility expert, they went to the creator who creates. They went to the author of life to give life. Genesis 52, then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel, so the physicians embalmed him. What are they saying here? Are they saying that the physicians brought Joseph's father back to life? Nope. It says that they embalmed his father They were employed in some sort of duty, but the humans did not heal. They simply did something to assist in a process that God established. God is the one who establishes whether Joseph's father is going to live or he's going to die. And then the assistants do what they've been taught to do by God, not by man. They've been taught to do this by God and they do it accordingly. And therefore, they are not the ones healing. They're simply the ones obeying what God has said to do what he has established them to do according to his instructions. Exodus fifteen twenty six. he said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the, the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So he made a name for himself. He proved to, to the Israelites that he is the Lord. He proved that he is the one who brings destruction. He is the one who brings disease, famine, plague, pestilence, etc. He's also the one who heals you. And he heals you if you return to him. We see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We see it throughout the Bible. Return to me and I will heal you. Exodus 21, 19. The one who struck the blow will not be held liable if the other can get up and walk around with with a staff. However, the guilty party must pay the injured person for any loss of time and see that the victim is completely healed. I'm going to come back to that one, but I want you to hear the context that there's something that's going on in terms of observing whether someone is healed or not. Again, in Leviticus 13, 18, when someone has a boil on their skin and it heals, so you're observing, you're observing here, that's going to be important. Leviticus 13, 37, if however the sore is unchanged so far as the priest can see, and if black hair has grown in it, the effective affected person is healed. They are clean and the priest shall pronounce them clean. All right, here's what the word is establishing because the word talks about in Leviticus 13 and 14 regarding defiling skin disease and regarding a mold inside of a house. There is no other account at this point in history of major diseases that are being brought on people. They might be brought on the wicked or in certain situations But they didn't have all of these syndromes and conditions and diagnoses that we have now. Why? Because there was not an increase in wickedness yet. That's why we're dealing with what we're dealing with now. Jesus already told us that. He said when a spirit goes out of a person, it goes through arid places looking for rest and does not find it, comes back to the house, finds the house unoccupied. It's unoccupied because they haven't returned to God. They haven't repented or turned from their wicked ways, received his ministry, anything else. Otherwise, they'd be occupied by a spirit. So they're unoccupied, swept clean, and the spirit brings with it seven more, more wicked than itself. And the final condition of that person is worse than it was in the beginning. So they didn't have all these diseases we have today. They did at the time that Jesus came because wickedness was increasing. Their hearts were being hardened. And when Jesus came and he healed people, he acknowledged why it was that this was going on. In some cases, he said it was to, for the glory of God to be revealed because he wanted to establish that God is the one that heals. In most cases, he said, repent and sin no more. In all cases, they are supposed to return. We are supposed to return to God. God is doing something. That's what he's establishing. Either it's for his glory and or 
It is for us to lean into him more in order for him to speak with us. If it's chronic, if we're being harassed by that spirit, if it's a chronic issue, chronic illness, chronic whatever it is, that's a spirit. God is going to let you know if he's given you a thorn, if he's given you an affliction, which he does frequently, more frequently than we acknowledge. If he's done that in order to keep you close and low, then that's according to him. But he will let you know if that's something he's done. But if you're coming out of major illness and chronic issues, he's going to heal you. It just may not be full restoration. You might have certain symptoms that he has required in order to keep you low, but he will let you know that just as he did with David. David well understood that because he talked about it. Paul well understood it because he talked about it. Now, what was being established in Leviticus 13 and 14 is that a priest who we could call a physician. We could say that they were, you know, sort of a physician's assistant is the way that we, prob- we probably would translate that most accurately into a physician's assistant. But even a physician's assistant is like prescribing you medications and things like that. But here, understand, this is what was established. They had defiling skin diseases. There was uh, mold inside of their house. They brought their whatever that rash was, to the priest, and the priest observed. That's all he did. He observed. He took note of what was going on with the rash. The person was then required to go into isolation for seven days. God has established isolation. He has established what he's doing when he tells you to go into isolation. During Passover, when he said, close your doors, put the blood of the lamb over your door, close your doors, rid your house of yeast, which represents sin, They would have understood this because God had already established it through Passover. You close your door, you isolate, you rid your house of sin, you return to him, you trust in him, you do what he commanded and he will heal you. I am the Lord who heals you. Return to me and I will heal you. When I send these things, if you return to me, I will heal you. And the person would come out of isolation after seven days and the priest would take a look and he would say, yep, it's healing. No, it's not. And that's why these types of instructions were given. If, however, the sore is unchanged so far as the priest can see, and if black hair has grown on it, the affected person is healed. They are clean and the priest shall pronounce them clean. All the priest is doing is he's observing and he's pronouncing. He's pronouncing them clean or unclean. And so God gives this like detailed instruction. I'm only reading a a piece of it. You can read it for yourself. It's in Leviticus 13. If the person started changing, so like, for example, maybe the sore was unchanged so far as the priest can see, but black hair has grown on it, the affected affected person is is clean. They're healed. That's what God has said. So here's what you're to look for. Again, is the priest doing anything other than observing and pronouncing what God has established nothing more. He didn't say, go grab some holy basil, go use this tincture, go use that essential oil. Let's observe your Enneagram type, whatever it is. I don't, I don't know the language of Enneagram. I don't want to. No, he didn't do any of that. All the priest, just like those referred to as physicians who were embalming, all they're doing is what God established. The priest observed And then he was, and then he said, okay, go into isolation. Then they came out of isolation. He observed again to see whether there, what, what the change was. And if they were changed according to what God said, then they were pronounced clean. They were pronounced healed. Understand what God was doing. What he was saying is that this person is bearing the fruit of having returned to him as he established of having been dealt with by him, of having received his ministry, dealt with their sin, repented. Now they're demonstrating that fruit. And so the priest would then say, he wouldn't even say, okay, you're like, you're good and you can go back to your life. He would then say, go back into isolation for seven more days to finish it up, finish what God has started. And if they weren't healing, God would cast him out of the camp. Why would God cast him out of the camp? Or he commanded that the priest was to cast them out of the camp. And if they didn't, until they demonstrated that they were healing, they were not allowed back in. Why would God then punish them? Because that's a punishment. Hello. Why would he punish them? For the same reason that Paul was saying, hand this person over the spirit of Satan. For the destruction of the flesh, that they might be saved. They need to go. Purge Israel. 
you're not to have this. You're not to hang out with this. You're not to allow this in the camp. Well, what do we see today? We see Pope Francis saying that these people are, that LGBTQ plus are not supposed to be marginalized. They're supposed to be integrated into society. And by society, he means the church because he claims to speak for the church, which of course he does not. But that's in direct opposition to the word. Sounds sweet. Oh, who am I to judge, right? Yeah, well, you're not to judge, but you are to test the spirit and to discern the fruit, and you are to keep Israel clean and purge Israel of evil. You're not to integrate them. So same thing with a house that was defiled by mold. And of course, God refers to us as a house. They'd shut up the house for seven days. If the mold was not remitting, if it wasn't going away, then they were to tear down every single stone and take it out of the camp, outside of the camp. Again, same message. What affects one part of the body affects the entire body. Are we now going to join Christ's body with a prostitute? You remember Paul saying that? No, we don't do that. That house gets torn down. We are a house. The temple that God is describing are stones. And so when you're tearing down those stones and you're bringing them outside of the camp, do you remember that Christ said not one stone would be left on another? That human temple was a defiled temple. Defiled things were going on in there. Making his temple a marketplace, placing heavy burdens on people. The Pharisees were using what God had established in that temple in order to make themselves rich. What are the Pharisees doing today? They're continuing to preach tithing to make themselves rich. You do this, God will sow a blessing or you're sowing a blessing and God's going to build on that blessing and he's going to make you rich and he's going to give you everything you want because he's daddy big bucks and that's how we treat him. That's crazy wicked. God is indeed going to circumcise your heart from money, from that being an idol, and he's going to have you using your money for certain things and he's going to test your heart to see if you're going to do it. But don't think that he's going to do it in a church that tells you to sell, sow a blessing and is getting rich off of manipulating and distorting the word of God in order for them to become rich and to lead you back to a law that's already been fulfilled. Sacrifice has been fulfilled. That was associated with sacrifice. Any stone in the temple that is defiled is going to be removed. God is not going to have a defiled temple. That is what we are to understand. And someone, um, someone sent me a message this morning. And they had said something about um, that it's difficult for them to understand some of the things that God established in, uh, you know, sort of ritual laws and, and the Old Testament, that it's difficult for them to understand. And when I responded, one of the things that I said is that you always want to understand the heart of God and the, enti the Bible as a whole. What was he establishing in the physical sense in order for us to understand in the spiritual sense? Now, look, we can't do that in our carnality. We have to do that by the Holy Spirit. So again, I've said this in other videos, if you want to understand scripture, if you want to understand something that God established, seek his heart, pray to him and tell him, Lord, I want to understand your heart on this. And he's going to start reminding you of, he's going to start putting the scriptures together for you. That's not something you're really capable of doing. So when it happens, don't think that you're wise in your own eyes. Don't think you're doing that. He's doing it. He's reminding you of the scriptures that you're familiar with now in the New Testament and what he was building. So you're going to be seeing how God is building the foundation and then he's going to build those blocks up so that you understand spiritual things. I shared with you in another video that um, one of the things that was really hard for me to understand was Lot's daughter sleeping with their father. I was really upset about this when I read it. And I turned up to God and started judging him and said, how could you let this happen? I was just so distressed over it. And I turned it into judgment against him. And, you know, I share that with you because we do it a lot. And I realized in the weeks to come just how frequently I actually do that. And he spoke with me so sharply saying to me, you don't get to judge me. And part of what he was teaching me is you got to understand my heart. And what he said to me is, would you like me to judge you based on my standards, based on my righteousness, based on the times you're living in or different times? So I understood very clearly because God looks at us based on a, the circumstances and he moves us based on the circumstances that only he understands, right? So for example, my upbringing that I've, I've spoken about on this channel, the abuse that I endured led me into certain idolatry and sin. Has God not had compassion on me? Does he not have compassion and understand the things that we've been through and work with us based on healing us from the things that we've been through and 
compassion and gentleness and understanding of why we ended up engaging in that idolatry and sin? Absolutely, he does. He takes a look at everything that we don't even, can't even possibly understand. He takes a look at the, you know, deception that we were born into in this world. He takes all of that into consideration and he builds us accordingly. And so that's what he was showing me with Lot and his daughters as well. He deals with his people, but he deals with his people as only he can deal with his people in his righteousness, not in our self-righteousness. And even in that, you know, I, it was a very difficult thing for me to understand, for me to wrap my head around, especially because of the way that I was raised and some of the things that I went through and the incest that, you know, happened in my family. It was really hard for me. But he spoke with me in a stern way, first of all, rebuking me for the way that I was speaking to him. And remember, again, he says, if someone sins against you, you rebuke them. If they, for, if they repent, then you forgive them. And so my heart was brought into that position. And I, I you know, lowered, I mean, he lowered me and I lowered myself. And I, I, and I said something to the effect of, I don't ex exactly remember the way that I was praying, but I, I was repenting. I'm sorry, Lord. You're absolutely right. I have no, no business judging you. Help me understand. And then he spoke gently to me and he helped me understand. He did exactly what he tells us to do. If we rend our heart to him, if we repent, if we turn from the wickedness, you know, my self-righteousness, that's wickedness. If I turn from that and I humble myself and I receive him and I ask him, Lord, change my heart. Help me to understand your heart. What were you doing here? What were you establishing? He will tell you. So again, I'm using my testimony. Understand, I'm not speaking here as an expert. I am speaking, the only expertise I have are what God has built in me. That's all I have, you guys. I don't have any expertise in my degree. In fact, that was the absolute opposite. I became a fool with my degree. All my wisdom, my worldly wisdom led to, and all the world's wisdom in medicine and all the other people that I was going to, psychology, all that led to was foolishness and death. I had to become a fool to become wise. And even still, it's not my wisdom. It's godly wisdom. It did not come from me. Okay, so again, we're taking a look at the building blocks. God's just building. And this is why I'm going from Genesis to the New Testament, because I want to help you understand the pattern that God established. Why would I go with any other pattern? He started out in Genesis, letting you know that no one else healed Abimelech and his wife, his female slaves, so that they could have children again. Only the author of, you know, the creator, the author of life can give life. And so why would you go anywhere else? So Abraham prayed to God. Then Joseph directed the physicians to embalm his father. These, they are assisting God in what he has established. They are obeying God in what he has commanded. And, and truly, I think that saying that we're assisting God, that we're being used by God, would be a, that, that's a correct way to, to speak that. Because God doesn't actually need us, does he? He doesn't need us for any of this. He desires that we will be used by him and that that is part of our covenant. So if we want to be saved, we have to be used by him. So the physicians were embalming. They were obeying what God, what he had established. So then he makes a name for himself. He del delivers the Israelites out of Egypt. They obey him. They're spared. And he says to them, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Who brings the diseases? He does. For I am the Lord who heals you. Do you see how he's building some building blocks? And now he's moving in in Exodus 21, Leviticus 13, Leviticus 14 to showing you observe what's happening observe whether someone is being healed or not. If they are being healed, they're bearing the fruit of having returned to him. If they're not being healed, they're not. You know what? If that's hard for you to understand, you got to receive it from God, but you cannot deny what he established in his word. I understand it's a hard thing to accept, but you have to receive this from God. So if you have people in your life who are dying, who have diseases and illnesses, what are they doing with it? Are they going to medicine to break down the temple? Because that is idolatry. And even with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were told that you're going to go into the furnace and you're going to be put in this fire, 
if you don't bow down to this God. Hello, if you don't bow down to this God of science, you're going to experience all these other things. That's what we experience, right? And God was capable of sparing them, even though the guards outside of the furnace who were ordered to make the furnace, what was it, 10 times hotter or however many times hotter, they died outside of the furnace. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not a hair on them was singed. And you know what they said before they went in there? They said, our God can heal us from this. Our God can save us from this. We still won't bow down to your God because we know that he's capable of doing it. But even if he doesn't, and I know that you think that too, and I thought it too when he told me, throw all this out. Even if he doesn't heal you, we're still not going to bow down to that God. Those attitudes were established as a, an example to us. Even if he doesn't, I still will not bow down to that God. I still will not place an idol before him. I still will not seek a field that fundamentally it has been built on the foundation that there is no God. Do you understand that? That's the foundation of the field. There is no God, no creator, no author of life. If you believe that he created you, you got to believe that he can heal you. And even if he doesn't, that you will trust in his will and you will not bow down to an idol. Numbers 12, 13. So Moses cried out to the Lord, please God heal her. So this is referring to, I think this is referring to Miriam and he did heal her. But he also made her deal with it a little bit, didn't he? And why did he send that leprosy to her? Because she had sinned. So he was dealing with her. So you got to understand, if he is dealing with you, then you got to deal with yourself by examining yourself and letting him minister to you regarding your sin. It's not enough for you to say, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. You got to be ministered to. You got to take a look at why did I do that? What was in my heart? What led to that so that I don't sin again? Deuteronomy 28, 27, the Lord will afflict you with the boils of Egypt and with tumors, festering sores, and the itch, yikes, from which you cannot be cured. Who will, who will afflict you? Who will do these things? The Lord. If the Lord does it, why would you go to someone else to fix it? If the Lord does it, you got to be dealt with by him. And one of the it's such a beautiful thing that someone said to me this morning is that she knows, you know, God has not removed her symptoms yet. There are some things that he has done that he is slowly doing in her life, removing fear, removing, you know, giving her a spirit of peace, doing these things in her life, helping her to know that he's the one talking to her. But you know what? If he did it too quickly, you wouldn't appreciate it. You wouldn't glorify him. You'd think it was something you did, that it was by chance. It just wouldn't hold any weight. So he's growing those roots. He's making sure that those roots are way down deep in the ground so that when the sun comes over, it is not going to scorch you. And she said to me something to the effect of, I know God's doing this and I know that he's testing me right now to see if I'm going to go back to the vomit, to see if I'm going to go back to doctors and medicine to make this go away. He is testing me. And understand that when he's testing you, he is building you. And that's such a beautiful understanding to have his spirit, I mean, it is more to have that understanding and wisdom than to even have those symptoms go away, quite frankly. And that's what, I mean, in a couple messages that she sent me, this is something that she's been illustrating is that this is everything. This is where it's at. And I know that she wants those symptoms to go away. I understand. But that is the fruit as well of being in him, that he's not going to do this all of a sudden. He's not going to do it all at once because he's got to build you in it. So that you don't, he doesn't lose you again. That's part of the way that he is going after the one, right? The one in the flock. The, he's got the 99 and he's going after that one. And he's going to make sure that you don't leave again. Not because he goes and chases you down and forces you and anything else. But this is the way that he's hurting you back. He's making sure that you're going to stick with the flock. You're not going to leave again when he builds you. And I got to tell you something, when you feel him doing that, there is nothing like, you can go through anything. You can go through anything as long as you have him. Just like Peter said, when, when uh, people were falling off, the, you know, there were disciples that were falling off and they were saying, this is too hard a teaching. Who can understand it? And they were leaving. And Christ turned to the apostles and he said, you're going to leave too? 
And they said, Lord, you have the words that lead to eternal life. Where would we go? That's how you end up feeling. I've told you in other videos that when I first started to hear God in, that, in this way, that I just used to say over and over, crying, sobbing, weeping, because I was so happy. I would say, Lord, I can go through anything if I have you. Anything. There is nothing I can't go through as long as I feel this. As long as I feel your presence inside of me and your peace. And I want you to understand that there are things we're going to go through. And God is going to increase his presence in those times. And he is going to make sure that those who love him and pick this up, that we will have the strength to endure it. We're going to have the strength. So if you're watching videos that Hollywood has put out of people, you know, going through certain things and, you know, being burned at the stake and that sort of thing, I don't want you to watch those videos, first of all, because you look at them and you start getting scared because you see the pain that they're going through and everything else. But I want you to remember what's in the word. I want you to remember that Stephen, while he was being stoned, said, I see God's face. You have nothing to be afraid of. You just imagine how much you love the person in your life you love the most, more than anything in the world, and what you would do for that person. How much more will he do for those who are willing to go through this for him? He's got you. Just hold on a little longer and pray for him to turn your heart. Pray for him to turn your heart to do the things that he commands and to reveal to you what his desires are to reveal to you whether what I'm saying is true. I never ask you to take my word for it. I only tell you what he has built in me, what he has proven to me. And I tell you to ask him. I always shepherd you back to him. I go through scripture with you. I show you what the scriptures have established, what he established in his word, what he desires, what his heart is. Deuteronomy 28, 35, the Lord will afflict your knees and legs with painful boils that cannot be cured, spreading from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I myself am he, there is no God besides me. I put to death and bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal and no one can deliver you out of my hand. Oh, please hear this. I'm going to read it again. See that I See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. And no one can deliver out of my hand. If you return to him, do you think for a second that God's going to say, well, you returned to me, but you didn't take that pill. So sorry, not going to heal you. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And it's even more ridiculous when you think about where that pill came from, when you think about that Christ and none of his disciples ever used a pill, ever used anything to heal. And of course, you know, in the other video, I'm going to talk with you about those leaves in Ezekiel that are referred to as healing. It's not in the context of medicine. And you see as well here that he is using healing congruently with salvation. Because he says the same thing about salvation, right? No one can deliver you out of my hand. It will be irrevocable. See now that I myself am he. There is no God's, God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. And no one will deliver you out of my hand. I will heal. I will save. Do you understand that God has modeled your body, your physical condition after your spiritual condition? What's going on with you spiritually is being manifest, is being shown to you in the physical realm so that you can understand what needs to be done in your heart in order for you to be saved, in order for you to be healed physically and healed spiritually, which is salvation. Do you see that? If you don't see it, you got to pray about it because that needs to be clear to you in order to understand how to heal physically you must heal spiritually because God's end game is not about you not having boils on your body. God's end game is that your soul is going to be saved. So if he has to afflict you physically in order for you to stay close to him in a thorn, which is different from illness, that's not illness. I don't cough because I'm ill. I cough because that's 
the thing that he keeps me close with. He's already told me that. He's already let me know that this is a thorn. I don't have the strong body that I once had because you know what I did with that strong body? I did whatever I wanted. I used it. I abused it. I did not glorify God in it. And so I'm going to glorify God in my weakness. He's not going to let me go back out of the fold. He's going to keep me in through this weakness. You're going to come to understand the difference. He will not chronically attack you, but he will give you an affliction to keep you close. 1 Samuel 6, 3, they answered, if you return to the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it back to him without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. Do you understand what he's establishing here? He is establishing that he is the one who does these things, what you need to do in order to be healed. 1 Kings 18.30, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Okay, the repairer of the altar of the Lord. So is he the physician or is he doing something for God? Is he being used by God to do what God established, to do what God wants him to do? Have I ever once claimed that I can heal you, that I can drive out a spirit from you? Never, not once. The books that I have written stand on what God did in me and what he says in his word. I could be referred to as an assistant to Jehovah Rapha, used within this context. But see, you have to read the context in order to really understand because even in, you know, as if you're just reading the description that Strong's uh, pulled out of it, the, the descriptor words that they pulled out of it, because, you know, that's just what they're pulling out of it. They're just looking at the different contexts and what's happening in these different contexts. But I, what I'm telling you is you got to read the context in order to understand it a layer deeper because the way that God is using this in a sentence is he's not saying or implying in the context that these people are doing something apart from God. He's implying that they are being used by God. God is doing something through them. And that, so we don't get to go then and, you, and make up our own definition that God is going to work through someone who stands on the authority of the world. Because none of these people are standing on the authority of the world. There was witchcraft going on in the world. At that time, there was witchcraft going on in the world. You see that Ahaziah, when he fell through the lattice in the roof and he was injured, that he sent the men to go consult from of Beelzebub whether, they were gonna li- whether he was going to live or die. And what did Elijah say to him? Is it because there's no God in Israel that you're going to go and consult of Beelzebub as to whether you're going to live or die? Because you've done this, now you will surely die. And he did. Do you understand the implications of that for us? None of the people in the Bible ever would have, been, would have received the people referring to them as heroes. Not for one second would they have received that. Would they have referred to themselves in the way that physicians refer to themselves today? In the way that they are trained up to believe that they are gods? Never is there an instance in scripture where they broke down the temple by drilling into the skull, bloodletting, drawing out your blood, giving you pills, opening up your body, pulling out parts that God put in, cutting off parts because you don't feel like what God created you inside. Never is there any reference to that. That was witchcraft. This is a field that breaks down the temple of God, speaks on the authority of evolutionary biology, Satan, who hides behind evolutionary biology, kills babies, refers to babies as a group of cells, not a living thing, a group of cells, defers to the research of pharmacia, breaks into your body because you're not happy with the way you look, injecting fillers, sucking out fat, turning you into a caricature. That is what you think God's going to use. And you can say all day that, well, this person is a good Christian. They're, they're a good doctor, a good Christian. Really? Why are they in that field then? Why do they not see those things? Why have they not been given the eyes to see this? Why are they doing things in contradiction to the word of God and what he has established? He will not anoint their hands. He will not yield his glory and praise to idols. He will not use that field. And if he could give me eyes to see and pull me out of the field that I was in and cause me to let go of my entire livelihood, 
why wouldn't he do it to others? Second Kings 2.21, then he went out to the spring and threw salt into it saying, this is what the Lord says. I have healed this water. Never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. Now let's test your heart here. Did the salt heal the water or did God heal the water? Second Kings 2.22, and the water has remained pure to this day according to the word Elisha sp had spoken. Second Kings 25, go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father says, your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go to, up to the temple of the Lord. Second Chronicles 714, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So what is it that you need to do in order to be healed? Take a pill? No. You need to humble yourself, pray, seek his face, turn from your wicked ways. Second Chronicles sixteen twelve. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from the physicians. All right. So you're seeing a different, you see why it's important for you to read the context. You're seeing, if you just read what Strong's has to say about it, you're not going to get the full understanding. God is differentiating in scripture between those who serve him, those who seek him, and those physicians who do not serve him, and those who are, have been afflicted who aren't even putting the Lord before them. You have, to distinct, you have to distinguish between a physician that is from God and a physician that is from the world. And of course, any word that you're using, if you're using the word physician, you already have connotations with that. The physicians, such as Luke, the beloved physician, any of those who are serving God, who are physicians that are working for him, are going to work as he did, are they not? Are going to shepherd you to him. So he has appointed me, he has anointed me, he has built in me a testimony and had me write these books and share with you what he did with me based on the word. At no point do I ever shepherd you to myself. At no point do I do that. I teach you in a very different way from what they do out there. And even, and I, you know, about a week ago, I had uh, someone who I work with in a workshop say to me, oh, it's so frustrating. I think, uh, I think their husband actually had said to them, ask, ask Carrie about this or something like that. I can't remember what, this, what the situation was. But, but I mean, these situations hap happen frequently. And even, you know, people will get a hold of me and ask me, will you do a video on this? And I, I do the video, but I never say, I'm always speaking on the authority of God. I'm always shepherding it back to him. And so this person asked me the question and said, I know what you're going to say. And I, and I told him already, she's not going to answer it. She's going to tell me that God needs to answer this. And I know that for some people that can be frustrating because we are so used to putting people, putting psychologists and experts and, you know, so-and-so in front of God seeking the answer from them. But let me tell you, God has taught me how to stand in the authority he's given me. And he has been very serious to that end, that I am not to stand in the place of him. If there is something that someone is asking me that they should be asking him, I don't answer that question. Or I might say, well, here's my experience through my testimony. Here's what the word says, but you got to receive that from God. That's the order that I go in. Never ever do I tell you what to do, but you know what? The world does it. I've watched them do it. And I was even listening to an attorney say, there was an attorney that was speaking about something. I can't remember the context, but she was talking about how mental health is destroying marriages, how someone goes in for therapy. And rather than speaking on the authority of God, and knowing that no one, what man, what God has brought together, no man is supposed to separate. They start feeding into this, you know, this idea that, oh, your husband doesn't respect you. Oh, he doesn't, does he? Rather than speaking on the word of God and having them be healed and shepherding them to God to be healed by him and to understand from him 
what's going on and what they're doing to elicit or to defer as an idol or whatever it is, whatever their sin is that brought them into that situation, they start breaking up that marriage that God established. It's true. I've seen it happen. They stand in the position of God as an idol, wise in their own eyes with their own stuff and their own issues that they work out on the people they're seeing. Alice Miller warned about that in the 1970s. I talk about it in A Soul Aligned, that she warned about that. It's a phenomenon that is understood, that the compulsion to repeat, that if you have issues, you're going to go and you're not working through them and you're not healing from them, which mental health doesn't offer you any healing, by the way, you're going to inevitably work those issues out onto other people. So this is a self-sustaining satanic system that Satan has established in order to wound and traumatize someone through one person who hasn't healed, then that person is wounded and traumatized and they injure other people with that. And then they go to a field that tells them that they can heal them, that stands in the place of God, claims to have some sort of expertise, but does not stand on the authority of God, stands on the authority of research that reduces everything only to your carnality. That's the truth they stand on. And evolutionary biology. They have not healed themselves. They're a complete disaster. That is not a secret, is it? It's the big joke, isn't it? The people in mental health are nuttier than the people that they see. So now they haven't healed and they're working out their issues on someone who is already wounded. It is a self-sustaining satanic system. There's only one who can heal you. And the physicians or the assistants or the shepherds that God has established are going to shepherd you back to him and his word. And they're going to share their testimony with you. And that is the only, that is the only thing that they have to stand on. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you something else about that, about science, particularly mental health. You don't share your personal experience. You are taught not to share your personal experience. If you have no personal experience on which to speak, you have not healed. If you have no testimony, you have no business working with anybody. Second Chronicles 30, 20, and the Lord he- heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Job 5, 18, for he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, injures, but his hands also heal. That reminds me of Isaiah 45, 7. I form the light and create the darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Not me, then Satan does the bad stuff. He does all of it. He is the only one who is sovereign. So you got to stop acting like Satan has any power. You don't fight what God sends. You have to return to him in order to receive the reason why he sent it. And when you're going to medicine, you're fighting it. They even use that word. We're going to fight this infection. We're going to fight this together. We're fighters. What are they fighting? The will of God, what God has established in order to build you, in order to contend with you, in order to speak to his creation, the very way that he has established to speak to you, in order to deal with you, in order to call you in. When I send these things, if my people who are called by my name will return to me, I will heal them. Think about what you're fighting, because if you're going to keep fighting God, he's going to win. And what did Job say to his friends who were giving him all of this wise in their own eyes advice? He said, you, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. And then God rebuked them too. You need to be able to differentiate what a worthless physician is and what a true shepherd is. And again, I've told you that, you know, we all know about Paul's thorn. What about David? David in Psalm 6, 2 says, have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. Was David not afflicted? That isn't the only place that he talks about that. And then I've told you before, on one page, he's crying out. And on the next page, he's being healed. On the next page, God is saving him. Psalm 32, Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. Psalm 41, 4, I said, have mercy on me, Lord, heal me for I have sinned against you. Psalm 62, you have shaken the land and torn it open, meant its fractures for it is quaking. David understood. He understood that God is the one who heals us and he's the one that heals our land. And David knew what to do. Psalm 103, verse three, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who does it? And what is he doing? Forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Not some of them, all of them. 
because he's the one who sends them, because he's the one who's sovereign, because he's the author of life, because he's the creator. He heals all your diseases. Psalm 107 verse 20, he sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Psalm 147 verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Isaiah 6 10, make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. What would they do if they weren't calloused? Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Again, a reference to salvation. He's building the blocks for you to understand what is required in order for you to be healed, in order for you to be saved, that he has designed you and modeled you in such a way that your body should understand salvation, is representing, is manifesting what is required in order for you to be healed physically so that you will ultimately be healed spiritually. Isaiah 19, 22, the Lord will strike Egypt with a plague. He will strike them and heal them. They will turn to the Lord and he will respond to their pleas and heal them. Isaiah 30, 26, the moon will shine like the sun and the sunlight will be seven times brighter like the light of seven full days when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicted. Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That is a reference to salvation. Do you understand that? Because I feel I hear people, and I did this myself when I was very sick, I would try to pray this over my illness, and it never worked. You know why it never worked? Because Christ says, return to him, repent. You have to pray and fast. You have to return to God and be healed. Understand that we are being healed in terms of our salvation through the wounds that were inflicted on Christ. Why? Because those wounds represent him taking on our transgression and we, us having the ability, the opportunity to be healed through what he did. Not because we plead the blood of Jesus over our sin. That is a ridiculous and superficial way of understanding healing, just as ridiculous and superficial as what they preach in these, you know, healing ministries where they prophesy from the delusions of their minds, they scream out spirits and tell you that you're healed. You just got to go believe it. Meditate on the stripes that healed you. Meditate on the wounds that healed you. This is ridiculous. It is ridiculous because it completely lacks understanding of the opportunity that we have been given through the sacrifice of Christ to be healed through faith and doing what he said to do in obedience, submission, and reliance. That we return to God, that we repent and turn from our wicked ways. We don't say a prayer and then we're healed. It's shameful. That is shameful and wicked to believe that. It is a complete lack of understanding. Shame on those who are teaching this. Shame on those who are teaching this superficial healing because they have not healed themselves and that is all they have. A delusion that they fabricated because their goal is for their glory and money. That's why God's got me in this position. And every time I see that, it makes me grateful that I'm in this position, even though it's, it's, it can be hard sometimes when I'm wondering, how are you going to take care of me, God? How are you going to fill up the pools of the earth when there's no rain, right? You remember that from Second Kings? He fills up the pools of the earth with no rain, and this is an easy thing for the Lord. How are you going to do that though, right? But he's brought me to a place where I don't, I don't, I am not living by the works of my hands. That is for sure. I'm not paying the bills by the works of my hands. And I am so grateful that he has circumcised me from that because there's nothing in it for me. It is a pure and true message. And that's how it's got to be. I have to put my faith where my mouth is. I got to trust that God's going to take care of me if I'm doing what he has built in me. If I'm teaching what he has built in me. So now you see that the word is bringing you into understanding regarding what God has established between healing physically, healing that rash, healing that house, healing whatever it is, the disease, all of the diseases, all of the diseases. This is not an outdated word, you guys, because I hear people saying that, that we're basing things these days on an outdated word. But the word I'm reading that I believe in says that this word is forever. 
Heaven and earth will pass away before the words in that scroll pass away. Isaiah 57, 18, I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. Jeremiah three twenty two. return faithless people. I will cure you of backsliding. Yes, we will come to you for you are the Lord, our God. Jeremiah six fourteen. they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say when there is no peace. So now you see that he's talking about a different kind of healing, a counterfeit healing that is coming from worthless shepherds, worthless physicians, those who claim that they have an answer in a healing ministry, in a deliverance ministry, bringing in pagans to do sound baths and Enneagrams and chakra healing and Reiki over you, or even just preaching a superficial message, using scripture to preach a superficial message instead of having understanding and wisdom on which you speak, helping people to understand this is what God means. This is what this means, just like I did with you, with the, you know, by your stripes we are healed, by your wounds we are healed. Helping people to understand that healing is synonymous with salvation. Jeremiah 8, 11, they dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say when there is no peace. Jeremiah 8, 22, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Jeremiah 17, 14, heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved for you are the one I praise. Jeremiah 19, 11, and say to them, this is what the Lord sa- Almighty says, I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topheth until there is no more room. Jeremiah thirty seventeen. but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are called an outcast, Zion, for whom no one cares. Jeremiah 33, 6, nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people and let them enjoy abundant peace and security. Babylon will suddenly fall and be broken. Wail over her. Get balm for her pain. Perhaps she can be healed. Jeremiah 51, 9, we would have healed Babylon, but she cannot be healed. Let us leave her and each go to our land for her judgment reaches to the skies. It rises as high as the heavens. Lamentations 2.13, what can I say for you? With what can I compare you, daughter Jerusalem? To what can I liken you that I may comfort you, virgin daughter Zion? Your wound is as deep as the sea. Who can heal you? What is God talking about there? He is lamenting over daughter Zion, and he is saying that her wound, these are his people, her wound is as deep as the sea. Who can heal you? Do you hear him using the language of wound and healing? In reference to salvation, you have to return to him if you want physical healing, and you have to return to him if you want spiritual healing. Ezekiel 34, 4, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have brought, not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. I'm going to leave this one in there because I, want, I think that it's important for us to understand that God is going to contend with us. He's going to contend with us until we have done what we need to do, until we have learned the lesson. He has proven that to me time and again. That is my testimony, that when I am suffering, I can greatly reduce my suffering by learning the lesson, by sticking with him and learning the lesson that he is trying to teach me and that my symptoms are not going to remit until I learn that lesson. So if you're doing the work and the symptoms aren't remitting, it's not because the work doesn't work. It's not because God is not listening to you. You're going to know when you've done it because you're going to see that it remits or you're going to see that it lightens up. There are some that may take a couple weeks, may take some time for you to really lean in, but you got to receive this from him. So if you're doing it or you're saying that you're doing it and it's not going away or it's not remitting, you got to go deeper and you need to ask him, how How do I do this work? I've given you a template. I've shared with you my testimony. I've shared with you what the word says. I've given you those resources, but still you have to go in deeper with him. You have to receive it from him. You got to lean in like your life depends on it because let me tell you something, your life depends on it. 
and he has promised that anyone who comes to him, he will not turn away. So if you're truly rending your heart to him, you're going to know that he's doing something in you. Just like this person that I'm talking about who's doing the work, but not all the symptoms have gone yet, but they feel the peace of God, see what he's doing. They're, they are in that posture that God is bringing him into, which is, you know what? I know he can heal this. He hasn't made everything go away, but I feel him moving me. I feel what he's doing. I know that this is the right work. I know that he's in this. He's not just doing this with me. He's doing it with my husband. You're going to know that he's healing you. But until he has built you to what he wants you to build you, in, build you into, you may not get certain pieces of it. Certain parts of it may not remit. And one thing that this person has been sharing with me is that God is testing her to make sure that she's not going to go back to the vomit. She's not going to go back to the medications she was taking, the doctors she was seeing, the pagan practices that people were doing over her. She's not going to do those things, but she's got to be tested. So she knows what God's doing with her right now. She may not understand it. And when God's building us, we usually don't. It's pretty painful. But she knows she's being healed. She knows that he's in this. And what a miracle that he's not only doing it with her, but doing it with her husband alongside her, her husband with whom she is one. That should testify something to you. That if you have family members, you have children, you have a, a spouse who's an unbeliever, who you're worried about, when you start changing, so will they. Because God's giving you that authority to be a parent, to be a spouse, to be one with your spouse. And he's going to move through it. He's going to bless through it. He promises it. And so when, we, when we're talking about this and we say, oh, yeah, he's going to do these things, we don't necessarily understand it, but you start to see it in action, don't you? That is such an amazing testimony. Now, you tell me if you can hear the spiritual significance of this. Understand that the water, what is spiritual water, the Holy Spirit, Ezekiel 47, 8, this is him talking about the third temple. So remember, this is the question, one of the questions that this person had asked. He said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region and then goes down into the Arabah where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Well, there's a spiritual message in there, isn't there? Ezekiel 47, 9, swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. What is life, guys? What are we talking about here in the third temple? What is life? Swarms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. Do you understand the spiritual significance? That water gives you life. We're not talking about a literal temple or a physical temple, I should say. God is speaking to his people in the way that God has always wanted to speak to his people with true spiritual understanding. Science tells us that only that which is seen is real. Science wants you to stay there in literal, tangible, physical. That's not the way of God. That is not what God established. It is in opposition to God to cause you to only acknowledge what is true as that which is tangible, seen with your carnality, literal, physical, carnal. Do you understand how that's in opposition to God? Do you understand how this false gospel of science discredits God, discredits him, discredits what's important to him, causes you to do the same, causes you to go, that's crazy. You can't see that. Where's your evidence for that? Where's your research? God doesn't have any use for that. He uses our testimony, the foolish things of the world. What's our testimony in the world? Well, who are you? What do they say to Jesus? You're testifying on your own behalf. What's your testimony? What should that be worth to us? Same thing with the witnesses and servants of God. It's part of the reason why I believe that many of you have not been sharing your testimony, I've, although I'm so pleased to see that many more of you are now sharing your testimony on the channel. You got to be doing that. When you read someone else's testimony or you hear me talk about this and you're going through it or you're in a, st in a phase where you're like, what the heck is this? What is God doing? And I say, I know exactly what God's doing and I tell you and it resonates and he testifies to it. Does that not mean something to you? It means more to you than research. I can guarantee you that because it fills you. He fills you with his spirit and his and his witness, his Holy Spirit. He gives you a hope in him 
a confidence in him because you see what he's doing in your life and you see what he's doing in others' lives. And even though the world says, oh, that's a bunch of garbage, that's not true. Where's your evidence for that? Even though they say that, you can't deny it because he speaks to your spirit. And there's no way that you can fabricate what God does. Research is not a two-edged sword. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And it will cut through all of that nonsense that you have been trained to believe in the world. And it will get straight to truth. God's spirit will testify to it. So keep sharing your testimony. Ezekiel 47, 11, But the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Hosea 5.13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his sores, then Ephraim turned to Assyria and sent to the great king for help. But he is not able to cure you, not able to heal your sores. You hear that? No human being is able to heal you or cure your sores. Hosea 6.1, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Hosea 7.1, Whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed. They practice deceit. Thieves thieves break into houses. Bandits rob in the streets. Understand the spiritual significance of this, okay? They practice deceit. And, And yes, indeed, God is talking about thieves that are breaking into literal houses. Does a thief break into your house? Your house. You are a house when you are ingesting that false doctrine from false teachers. So whenever God would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed. They practice deceit, thieves break into houses, bandits rob in the streets. You see this pattern in scripture where God heals his people and then they or their descendants go back to the vomit. And when they go back to sin, he sends judgment again, whether it's judgment to the land, judgment to their bodies, they go into captivity, whatever it is. God established that pattern with his people. When you see these things, when, you know, when you go up into captivity, when these things are happening in your body, when he sends plagues, famine, destruction, you need to understand. His people need to understand. Those who claim to be in him, those who are supposed to understand the word, then understand you got to return to him. You got to be dealt with by him. And I want to warn you of something that medicine will make you think they, they give you all kinds of promises, right? I mean, I was in seven years, seven years of constant continuous medicine and mental health got worse, never better. Everyone pitched to me that this was going to help. Even in taking out like my tonsils and my adenoids, they said, though, this cough is going to go away. Well, it didn't go away. And now I don't have my tonsils and adenoids. So everything just goes right into my body. I don't have any line of defense constantly being sold something, right? Continuously. And then when it didn't work, you think anyone acknowledged it, acknowledged that they were wrong? Never once. And as long as you have resources, they just keep draining you and draining you. So here's what I want you to understand. God never says, I'm going to heal you one and done, and it's going to be done. It's going to happen all at once. He does it continuously. You're on a continuous journey of healing. And so you don't have any guarantee about what's going to happen in your, in your body necessarily. He's the one who's going to determine what needs to happen in you, what position you need to be brought into. But he will indeed remit on the symptoms. I've never had a situation with myself or anyone else where the symptoms did not, the, the chronic stuff did not remit. The thorn, like I said, on the other hand, he, there, there's most likely going to be something that he's going to keep you low with. But here's the thing is that people start to get impatient and they also don't want to do the work. And that's what happens when I see people fall is that they succumb back to this temptation and lie that brought them into that idolatry to begin with, that the world is somehow going to be able to do something that God can't, that they're going to be able to do it rapidly, right? I mean, think about this, like, you know, if you can't sleep at night, you have what the world calls insomnia or you have, you know, anything else going on and you take a pill to numb that out, to dole it out, right? Or to make you sleep that night. Do you not realize that these sleeping pills enslave you? They cause rebound anxiety so that eventually you're never going to be able to sleep. Doesn't matter how many pills you're taking. It is an enslavement and you get enticed because you want that instant gratification. You don't want to have to wait on God's timing. You don't want to have to do the work. You want that instant gratification, but you don't realize that you are burning God when you're doing that. 
When you start taking pills to send away what God has sent, and you don't trust that he can heal you, that he can give you relief tonight, you don't understand that your ability to physically rest has to do with your ability to, it has to do with you spiritually resting in him and trusting him being brought into that position, a spirit of fear being cast out of you because you returned to him. And now you got his spirit of peace. And now anytime that any of your fears come up, feelings of fear come up, you return to him and you rest in him and you do that immediately. So that that becomes who you are and what you're doing and you become reborn and changed through the process of obedience and continuing to return to him. You got to make your choice known, and that is a process. You don't just declare with your mouth, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ, all right, dunk, right? You go under the water, and now you're, now you're reborn. That is so superficial. That is such baloney. You have to live it, and you have to, be, you have to prove trustworthy. That is what Paul said as well. Those who've been given a trust... By the way, being part of the temple is a trust because if you're part of the temple, you have access to the temple. What you do affects the temple just like it affects the body of Christ. And you also have a purpose in the temple. Those who have been given a trust have to prove worthy. That's what Paul says. Don't fail the test. Don't fail the test because you wanted instant gratification. You got to think it through. When you start, if God pulls you out of something and now you're being tempted to go back to something else that just looks different, but it's the same darn idol, you got to deal with what's in your heart that's making you want to go through, the, go back to that idol. You got to think through what it is, what happens there. I was talking with a friend of mine a few weeks ago and I was saying, I've been wanting coffee. Like I've been, I used to love drinking coffee, but every time I've gone back to coffee, God has dealt with me. Oh boy, has he dealt with me. You don't do all this work to get attuned to listen to your, you know, listen, to, get into your heart and spirit, listen to the Holy Spirit, and then go amp yourself up with a poison that simulates fear response. Why are you doing that? Part of the reason I was doing it is because I, my flesh wants control. My flesh wants to have all this energy and do a bunch of things. And yet, even, you know, you look at coffee, to coffee starts taxing your adrenal glands. It actually makes you more tired, more jittery, more nervous, more fearful. How can you ever expect to be attuned to the Holy Spirit when you're jacking yourself up on that? And what he said to me, because I, I said, do you ever feel like you want to drink coffee? Because he too doesn't drink coffee. God took it off his tongue. And he said, yeah, occasionally I, you know, I have that thought or like I have that feeling that I want it. And I have to go through the motions of like thinking it through. And, you know, if I do this, then I'm going to like keep drinking it. There's not really going to be an end to it. It's going to, you know, fight against all of the work that I'm doing. I'm going to get pulled into the flesh. The flesh is going to fight against the heart and spirit because, you know, he does this work too. So he knows the language. He understands. That's what you need to do. You got to understand and recognize the schemes of the devil because more people fall during this tentative phase you know, where God is building you and, and, and he's proven himself to you and you have a spirit of peace and everything else. And now he, you know, now he's testing you to see, are you going to be built by him? Are you going to stay with him? Are you going to trust him to bring you through this? Or are you going to go back to those idols because there's some chink in your armor that's causing you to think that he's not enough or to think that you need to take control of the progress of what only he has control over? You know, the bottom line is if God doesn't want you to heal from a particular thing, you're not going to heal. Doesn't matter how much medication you take or how much, how many expensive procedures you have. That was my situation. I had all the money I, I could have needed in order to get any procedure. I had access to anything in the world. That's the position that he had put me in. And yet not one thing did a darn thing for me, but made me worse. Why? Because... I went and consulted Beelzebub over God as to whether I would live or die. And even when I did go to consult God himself, even when I did return to him, I believed that he would, was going to somehow heal me through Beelzebub. I was friends with the world and friends with him. Only in his mercy did God bring me into a position to understand that it had to only be him. I had to make a choice. I had to be single-minded. And there were times along this road that he has built me that he would say, all right, you've seen what I've done. What's it going to be? You can no longer do this thing if you want to be with me. If you want to do this thing that I'm doing, you got to choose. Now listen to the way that God feels about this, okay? Because this is really going to represent his heart. Hosea 11.3. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, 
taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. That breaks my heart. That honestly breaks my heart. Like it brings me to tears. It's been God caring for us all along. It's been God responding to our cries all along. And yet we're going astray all the time, always pursuing other idols. Our hearts are always running away from him. He's the one who created us. He's the one who gave us life. He's the one who has taken care of us all this time. And yet we go running to other people, places, things to heal us, to make us better, to tell us what happiness is. But it's him. It's been him all along. And not only that, but he's the only one who has power to do any of it. Hosea 14, 4, I will heal their waywardness and love them freely for my anger has turned away from them. You hear God's heart? You hear like all of the things, all the ways that we've spurned him, all the ways that we've hurt him. And yet he will still heal us if we turn to him. His anger will relent eventually. He will deal with us and he will teach us and he will take us by the hand. But we got to do our part. I hope that this has made it clear When God talks about Luke, the beloved physician, he's not talking about a physician who is doing things based on the world. We have established what physician means in the Bible, that physician, you have one physician, you have one healer, and it is Jesus Christ, Jehovah Rapha, and you have little Raphas, (laughs) right? You have these physicians who are assisting God but they are assisting him according to his authority, his truth. I work with you based on what God has built in me. I stay in my, at my post. I stay within what he's built in me. I'm not going to tell you how to play an instrument or how to worship him through that. I mean, I'm just using an example. I don't know if this is something that he necessarily does, that that's like something he sets someone apart for. Maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. But that's not the purpose for which he set me apart. It's not the purpose that he has built in me. It's not the purpose that he built in me through all my experiences from the beginning of, you know, the family I was born into to the field I went into to, you know, the experiences that I've had that he's sent in my life. So I'm not stepping outside of what he's done. What's important to him here in understanding physician is that God is not talking about just merely about the boils or the rash, or anything else. He's talking about shepherding his people in such a way that they understand what he has established, why he has established that, what they must do in order to be healed, how that ties in with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with what he established from the beginning until the end of the New Testament, or the Old Testament to the New Testament. If Luke was working in the capacity of physician. If he was working in the capacity of Rapha, he was working according to the way that he saw Jesus work when Jesus was working. Paul was a tent maker. Luke was a physician. There's some examples, right? So we might, if we, we might assume that Luke was working with people who were physically ill in the same way that I work with people who are physically ill, who are chronically ill, who are emotionally, it's bearing itself in emotional issues and physical issues. That doesn't mean that I speak on my own authority. It doesn't mean that I speak on the authority of science. It means that if I want to be used by him, I'm going to do what I do in a likewise manner to the way that Christ did what he was doing when he was here. I'm going to teach in a likewise manner. Do you think Luke for one second veered from what Christ established? If Christ said, here's the condition you're dealing with, here's the condition you're going to be dealing with. When a spirit goes out of a person, it comes back and finds that spirit unoccupied and swept clean, unoccupied because they haven't repented and they haven't returned to God. So they're not occupied. And then it brings with it seven more spirits, more wicked than itself. And the final condition of that person is worse than it was to begin with. And this is what's going to happen with this wicked generation. Why would you believe anything else? Why would you believe that Luke, the beloved physician, would be giving you pills or doing anything other than what Christ was doing and teaching when he was here? Luke was in position. He was a little Rafa 
one entrusted by God to do God's work. But it is only God who heals. It is only God who heals. You saw that language in the scriptures. You heard me read it. It is only God who heals. And he does not yield his praise or glory to idols. Thank you for listening. God bless you. I'll see you in the next video, which is going to be on the leaves of the tree that the, the leaves that heal on the tree that Ezekiel saw in the third temple.